The simplest way to demonstrate the main features of drawing a sphere is to use all matte white, a ball, flat surface and background. So let's take a look at this drawing of the sphere. We have the highlight. It may be a bit hard to see for you, but it is there nonetheless. Here's the little highlight. The highlight area lines up with the light's rays, which are coming right at this angle here. And it is a very small area. If the ball was shiny and very reflective, it would be easily seen. However, it is there on the matte object as well, and you should always leave it pure white nearly pure white or pure white, especially when you're just starting learning to draw. It is lined up with the um, exact 90 degree angle with the angle of, uh, light of ra uh, rays of light. So if you have a lamp, let's say, and then you can step back a bit and basically take your pencil and line it up with the center of the lamp and see where the highlight is on your ball and you'll see that exact ray of light, the direction of the light coming in. Once that light hits the surface of the ball, the area that forms 90 degree and very very close to 90 degree angle will be your highlight. This highlight is visible on all other round objects. Anything that is cylindrical anything that is a curved plane, anything that's round, uh, round and round like fruit, for instance, tomatoes, apples, uh, vases that have round curved surfaces, surfaces will all have this highlight. Next area to, high, uh, to our highlight is the center light. The center light is a rather wide range area. It is the area that is starting to curve away from light. It is not 90 degree angle anymore to the ray of light, however, it is still rather close to 90 degree. And as it curves away, the mathematics of it show that the degree of light that these areas receive as they curve away from light, while the degree changes um, mathematically and significantly, the amount of light that this area reflects doesn't change drastically. So therefore, when highlight is the area 90 degree and close to 90 degree angle to the ray of light, reflects almost all the light, which makes it look pure white or close to pure white. The center light area does not reflect as much light as highlight, but it still reflects a lot of light. Therefore, the color of it is mild and it is the next lightest area that we'll be drawing next to highlight. So keep that in mind. Keep in mind the fact that it's a lot of very light shading next to highlight that differs from the highlight by a very thin layer of this gray value. It is not a lot of change here. It does get a little bit darker as it approaches the half tones. However, it doesn't get significantly darker. And the next um, and third part of the light, the overall light of the sphere, is the half tones. Half tones are surrounding our center light. Half tones is a slightly smaller area, and it 
starts to form more of a crescent shape if you follow the overall shape of the half tones. It is uh, the, where the curvature of the sphere is starting to form more extreme angles toward the angle of our ray of light. When this happens, mathematics show that the curvature uh, forms a stronger angle, sharper angle toward the light. Therefore, the light will be bouncing off of this area less and less as it approaches the terminator. And because of that, the value, how light or dark the, this part is, starts to uh, increase, it starts to get darker faster and faster. It is still considerably lighter than the shadow itself. However, what happens is that this is like your transitional space between overall, overall light, which is the lightest part of the sphere, and overall dark, which is the darkest part of the sphere in the shadow and whatever else is reflecting in the shadow. So this is the area where you're starting to shade it and get darker rapidly. However, the most rapid part is right on the border with shadow. And the border with shadow is the terminator, which I'll be talking about next. The terminator is basically the borderline that is happening in any spherical, any round plane, curved plane object. It could be in a... Uh, anything that is cylindrical, anything that is uh, sphere and sphere-like, there will be a terminator and that is the border between light and shadow. A border between where the lights, uh, rays of light are coming and bouncing off of the surface of the sphere and coming to our eyes for us to see, and the area in the shadow where the rays of light are passing completely past this most uh, edge that is curving toward light. So all of this here is curving toward light, all of this is curving away from light, and the rays of light are basically passing right past it. They are no longer bouncing off of this um, part of the sphere, therefore forming a border that we name terminator, where the light is terminated. Here the light is bouncing off, here the light is not, direct light is not bouncing off, but rather reflecting off of other surfaces. You can think of it as light from the sun and the reflected light that is from other objects, indirect light. This is your direct light area, this is your indirect light area in the shadows. The main thing to remember is that once you find your terminator, the shadow will be forming on the opposite of light area, obviously, and the border uh, with the light is going to be the area where that rapid increase in value is happening. So from light to dark, the uh, darker value will be increasing rapidly as it approaches the terminator. Right at the terminator and a little bit past it is going to be your darkest area. And as you go away from the terminator into the main body of the shadow, there will be reflected light, thus making it look lighter. Core shadow is our darkest portion of the sphere. It is not very a large area, it rather reads like a strip, like a crescent shape that wraps around the sphere. It is the darkest, especially, uh, it's always darkest right along the terminator, but it is especially darkest in, the, in this, this particular, in this center of the shadow reason is, is this part of the sphere is closer to us. It gets closer to us by a few inches, a few um, 
uh, fractions of the inches depending on how large your sphere is. Obviously if the sphere is larger it's going to be closest, closer to us by a lot and these edges of the sphere will be further away from us by a lot. If the sphere is small, just let's say 5-6 inches across, it will be slightly less pronounced. But basically keep in mind that the darkest part of the shadow is going to be this particular center of it. Reason is, is it's closest to us and everything that's closest to us, the light to shadow contrast gets amplified. Our eyes perceive that everything that is closest to us with stronger contrasts, everything that's further away, even though it's by a little, our eye perceives it as less contrasting. Uh, if you keep that in mind and you capture this difference while maintaining the overall shadow being darker than overall light, you will be able to capture that um, three-dimensionality of the sphere. You will be able to make it feel like it really is a three-dimensional object and it, it has all the space around it by bringing this particular part of the sphere closer to us with a slightly darker treatment of the shadow and that shadow diffusing just a little bit however still looking like there's it, it's different from the reflected light so here's the shadow it is lighter than the this center shadow and the reflection is still here yet lighter than the shadow itself overall shadow is still being kept darker than overall light that's how you get the three-dimensionality of the sphere. The main thing to remember about the shadow and the reflected light in it is that your reflected light anywhere in the shadow reflected light never gets as light as the overall light, half tone, center light, high light. Uh, to achieve that and to separate them from the very beginning so you don't get confused, so you're not messing things up in here, once you find your terminator, go ahead and give this a pretty good strong layer, give it a, a, a pretty strong grade value first from the terminator into the shadow and as you work from the highlight starting to darken and give it stronger values toward the shadow this area will always stay darkest and you can always compare the value and darkness of this area or uh, the reflected light and shadow compared to your overall light this will keep you from making this too dark the light and from making your reflection too dark or too light so always compare all of them next to each other and see where uh, you perhaps need to darken or lighten it. So you may notice that right in here the reflection is the lightest, the strongest. There are always variations, just like there was a variation in darkness in the shadow, and this part is darker to bring it closest to us, there is a variation in the reflected light. Here the reflected light comes from the distant background, in which case I had a very white cloth in the back, but there is some distance to it. So already the light is not hitting that white cloth directly straight on, it has some angle to, uh, some angle to the light, therefore it's reflecting uh, not as bright as high light, but somewhat of a half tones or center light type of light. By the time that light bounces off the wall and hits the sphere, it is more diluted. It is not a very strong reflection. Here, however, the, the sphere is sitting right on the table. The table is also white. And because it's so close here and all of this bright light is reflecting into our eyes, it's reflecting into all the directions, it is getting right to this part of the sphere that is starting to turn more under the ball, under the sphere. And therefore it's facing more toward the table, more and more toward the table. Therefore it picks up more of the reflected light and the strong reflected light because this table and the angle of this table is pretty close to that 90 degree 
um, not perhaps as close as the highlight but it is a pretty strong light on that table so it's bouncing a strong reflection right onto the sphere therefore it stays lighter Uh, the next place we will take a look at is the uh, cast shadow. Three elements of the cast shadow is the um, cast shadow itself, the reflected light in the cast shadow, and the occlusion shadow directly under the ball. The cast shadow area is defined by the ball, by the sphere itself. Here is the direction of the light. The light comes from the la uh, lamp, light source, passes by this outmost curvature of the sphere, hits the table, reflects into our eyes, and obviously everything that was blocked by the sphere reflects considerably less light. Therefore, that's your shadow. Same thing on the other side, so you can see like this is about the angle. We can just transfer the same angle right here to this outermost curvature of the sphere and you can see how it comes right to here. This is the end of our shadow. This is where this side of the sphere blocks the light and it bounces to our eyes considerably less than the table which receives a pretty much straight on light at a slightly angular. And what happens with the cast shadow is it's always strongest directly under the sphere, right in this area. Uh, you should always observe it carefully, compare the values of it, compare the value of how light and dark the shadow is compared to the shadow of the ball. Here I had all white, so the table it was white, the sphere was white, the background is white. So their light and dark um, values are very similar to each other with a little bit of a difference for the background. Even the darkest portion, darkest shadow of the, in the background would be slightly lighter because it's pushed a little further back. So that little bit of the atmosphere gives us the slight atmospheric perspective which lightens up the uh, value. Remember I said this was the darkest portion for that uh, effect of three-dimensionality. Again, same thing, also atmospheric perspe perspective. To where closest to us we see it sharper, more contrasting. Further away it's slightly less contrasting, less sharp. Same thing happens with the cast shadow here. It is the strongest right here uh, where the light uh, passing past the sphere. The sphere is rather close and it's condensed area. It gets very dark. It's directly under the sphere. Less of the other light bounces to lighten it up and make reflections. There is a tiny bit of reflection here, but not a very strong one. The main darker area of the shadow is right on the edge with light. That is to show the strength of the contrast between light and shadow. The shadow always intensifies uh, and becomes the darkest before it transitions into light. Then the reflection within the shadow, which is mostly the stretched out part of the shadow, as you can see, it goes from the darker area very softly transitioning into light, uh, a rather lighter part of the shadow. It is your reflected light, indirect light that bounces off of other places. Not so much off of this table, since they're all on the same plane, but some of it is bouncing off of the wall and back, the wall, the fabric hanging in back of the sphere, and even a little bit off of this reflective light bouncing onto the shadow itself. So remember, light never stops bouncing. It may come to this wall, it may bounce off to the table, to the sphere, but then it also bounces off of the sphere to our eyes and to this shadow for making it lighter. It also bounces off of this shadow, now that it's lighter, back to the sphere and into our eyes. All of that makes us perceive it as various degrees of value, lighter and darker. So the more things reflect, 
the more we see the different values. And if we have colorful objects, if it wasn't a black and white study, we would also see reflected colors in there as well. The last thing is the occlusion shadow within the shadow. That is almost the last thing to work on before you go and start fine-tuning all the little details in here. The occlusion shadow is the tiny little slither of the shadow that almost obscures the transition between the edge of the sphere and the table. The reason is, is that this is an area deep under the sphere where least amount of light can reach. Not the direct light, obviously, and even the reflected light is struggling to reach that and reflect back to our eyes. The, this area is already a shadow, and this area is a shadow, and the shadows are starting to reflect off of each other to the degree to where once they get to where the ball is practically facing into the table, and the table is reflecting its darkness into the sphere, and the sphere is reflecting its darkness into the table, it becomes the darkest part of the whole shadow. Depending on what you're drawing, their colors and values, this might be the darkest area even compared to the object itself. So again, I had it white, white, and white, just to make it easier to see all those values, and that makes them very similar to each other. However, uh, observe carefully what you're drawing, and see if this occlusion shadow isn't looking even darker than the shadow over here itself. It can be. So let's take a look at how we can use those rules of drawing the sphere and shading the sphere with other objects. So here I have a small example. It's a, a small sketch drawing of a vase and it has a curved surface with other surfaces coming in. Um, you can see that here's the highlight. The highlight is very small area. You can see that right along the edge, it is also um, more of a highlight, slightly darker area stretches along. That's because this is where the edge of the vase is curving more rapidly and some of it is receiving considerably more light, uh, um, closer to 90 degree angles of light. However, this is the highlight, this is where it receives a strong close to 90 degree angle light. As it curves away, it starts to get a little bit of those center light tones, in which in this case the vase was um, greenish, bluish color, not too light, so it was medium in light and darkness overall, as is, and with the light bouncing off of it in black and white drawing, the light area, center light area, is already having a considerably strong gray value. As it started to turn away from light source even more, uh, it is starting to approach these half tones that are stretched over this area and getting toward the um, shadow, the core shadow area, which is all of this here, uh, minus disregard these portions of the vase that protrude out. But here is your shadow and the terminator, in this case, since it's not a spherical shape, is stretched right along this area here, right in here. So that is where the vase itself, the surface of the vase, curves away from light to such a degree to where the, and the light is also so strong that it passes right past this uh, side of the vase not reaching this area. This is our shadow. So right here the light is reaching it directly. Right here there is no direct light, only indirect light. In this case you can see the reflections here. One reflection intensifies here and it, it is a very small but 
very light and in, uh, intensified reflection that means that something over here was making it reflect stronger then reflection is more mild right here reflection is very mild right here uh, very close in value to the core shadow same thing is happening on this protruding parts none of the parts of the this vase are very sharp so pretty much it's all curved surfaces so this protruding parts they don't have a sharp edge the edge is still curving so that's where you go from your highlight and light toward your core shadow very rapidly but nonetheless it is a soft transition it's not perfectly outlined with the line and you can see that even within here the darkest part of the shadow there is a little bit of a reflected light even though all of this is in the shadow in the cast shadow there's a little bit of reflected light and this area here is looking also pretty dark and that's this part that's protruding going back and curving and back of the vase this is where it gets a little bit more of reflected light but here is where you have shadows reflecting into each other this much like with the sphere the cast shadow here is darkest right under the vase it is more amplified the darkness of it next to the light on the table and it gets the reflected light in the shadow right in here and the occlusion shadow is tucked in right into this corner and right under the vase right here you can see that it is uh, darker not by a whole lot darker than this but nonetheless darker that is your occlusion and you can see how it's transitioning into the part of the vase in a very uh, soft way hard to detect obviously we don't want to detect it very well we want to be drawn to the main part of the vase with the nice light and the reflections uh, studying its curvatures we don't want to be drawn to here so we don't want to amplify it now a little bit more complicated um, drawing is of the statue but I want to show you how the same rules of uh, shading a sphere work on curved surfaces that are much more complicated for example you can see that for instance this large wing coming off of the statue of Pegasus is having the same rule apply as a spherical shading the wing itself curves in this direction here and it's also curving into this shadow here and this area picks up the most light as it faces most into the light source in this case sunlight from there it starts to get darkened that's your center light and going toward the half tones right along this edge here you can see that right here where the area gets a little bit closer together it pinched in the way your half tones are showing more and this area here picks up more light so it starts to be closer to highlight center light and then it it goes into half tones as well here you have your center light going into half tones here the light gets picked up again and this is such a small area all the uh, light and shadow transitions get really jammed together very close but right here you see that soft transition to show the curvature and here's your terminator where the light no longer reaches so everything in this area is now going to be dark and within that the core shadow is most intense closest to the light right here you can see how that also helps to bring the wing forward closer to us the same core shadow further away on the back part of the wing is lighter that helps to push it a little back into that three-dimensional space and then within this whole shadow of the wing you have a play between different reflections and different little bits of shadows where it's pretty much almost like your occlusion shadows within the shadow where the uh, curvature of each of this uh, 
sculpted feathers is curving and making a deep groove uh, and that deep groove uh, pretty much creates that occlusion shadow so a darker shadow within the shadow and as it comes out it's reflected light that the curvature of each um, sculpted feather picks up. As you can see the tips here are intensified in darkness that is to not only the perhaps curving away a bit from this plane so this is almost the same straight plane but there is slight more curvature within that plane but it's to intensify it against the background which is very strong and light so we could maintain the overall silhouette to maintain the silhouette every time you have something very bright and light in the back you want to intensify your shadows when it gets to that border between the shadow and light, between the object shadow and the light in the back. And the same thing is happening to all of this sculpted rock, or perhaps it's supposed to be more like a cloud since it's a pegasus. And the since it's been very, very rounded, you can see that the same uh, rules of shading apply here as well. For instance, this is your light center light, half tones turn into a shadow, your core shadow um, follows the curvature, transition into reflection, uh, reflection transitions into uh, the next shape over. Same thing is happening here. Same thing of this being more intense, darker shadow compared to, let's say, this one in back of it, this one in slightly in back of it. This is closest to us, so the shadow is slightly darker. This is in back of it, slightly lighter. And you can see it, it's happening everywhere. Lots of plays between, like several spheres, basically, um, uh, stuck onto each other light, center light, half tone, transitioning into a shadow, a new um, sphere coming out of it, not fully in light, more of the half tones transitioning into shadow. And this overall uh, portion of the sculpted cloud has its own uh, terminator and its own core shadow that all of these parts participate in. So it's always good to see how other smaller objects form a bigger one and how the basic rules of the sphere apply in it as well. So overall this portions, all of these smaller spheres, irregular spheres clumped together form overall light, center light, um, highlights and some of the um, uh, half tones and this part overall forms your shadow and reflection with occlusion shadows right deep tucked in, in there. One of the most complicated uh, objects to draw is human form and the human face. However, if you study spheres and you draw simpler spheres and you shade them correctly and you know all the rules the more you draw the more you will see that the same things are happening in the human face as well it, it is just a much more complicated uh, level with lots of curved uh, planes uh, bouncing light in all the different directions so for instance right here we have the forehead that is turning most into the light. Therefore there is a lot of uh, highlights in this forehead including a few highlights that are kind of lightly picked up in the um, wrinkly surface uh, around the brow and uh, some of it is picked up in the nose and the cheek right above the cheekbone. Uh, all of this is your curved uh, planes. All the areas that are turning right toward the light to that 90 degree angle toward the light ray or very close to 90 degree angle. Likewise the overall forehead right here uh, is full of your center light and half tones. 
as the forehead is not perfectly round, it has the interplay between the um, center light and half tones, but you can see that the half half tones right here and the center light portions are distinctly light values. The values are, that are distinctly used for the light areas only. They are not used in the shadows. The shadows under the eyes, under the nose, the lip, under the lip, uh, under the chin here, they are all much, much darker. However, they are there and you can see them distinctly and that is the delicate um, well, you just get to practice to where you get the delicate transition between the highlights, light, and half tones to where they are not too strong yet visible and compared to your shadows, they are definitely lighter. Where is our terminator in such a case? So you can see that right here the shadow is forming on the edge of the forehead going uh, connecting to the hair the shadow that goes uh, minus the shadow of the eye socket and brow uh, the shadow goes over the chin right there the shadow goes right on the edge uh, I'm sorry uh, the shadow over the cheek the shadow right on the edge of the chin going under the chin under the jaw and uh, coming up this way so much like a very stretched out crescent it is the same core shadow and therefore the terminator is right along this edge. So this is where your half tones are starting to rapidly transition into the shadow and the shadow has a slight reflection on the end here. There's a tiny bit of reflection right here. Here it's so close to the edge the reflection is practically non-existent unless you draw it very big and you're able to squeeze in a little bit in there but it is so close to the edge it, the chick turns away from the light so rapidly that it's barely able to form this shadow and not much space left for the reflection however right here you have again a lot of interplay between the, ref uh, the, the shadow and the reflected light a little bit here you have again the edge of the chin blending with what's under the chin the cast shadow right here on the uh, neck you have a cast shadow which is coming from uh, the chin itself Right here the chin is turning away from light, your half tones are going into the shadow. The shadow is not as dark as right under the chin, which is where you also have a stronger contrast between the light and shadow. And the um, same thing is happening with your hair here as well. So all of this area is in the shadow, all of this mostly in the light, and hair being a little bit different type of material in reflecting light acts a bit differently but overall the same rules apply to the hair as well. Here's another little example of what you can do with light and shadow on curved surface. Um, for instance this uh, bald eagle has a white head it is curving, there is a curvature around the head and the neck. You have your overall shadow right here, which is uh, overall darker than the overall light. Within the light you have feathers and f forming slight variations and curvature, so you have your changes between the light, uh, center light, half tones, and you have changes between the darkest part of the shadow and the reflected light as well. Uh, the same thing is happening in the darker feathers where this part of the chest receives more light so it, it is full of darker value but it's, that value represents the light on the dark, very dark feathers and the shadow itself is even darker than this Therefore, that represents the shadow, the darkest part of the shadow of dark feathers. This is a good example where you have now two different color and values to start with, like the white um, feathers of the head 
in the more darker, very dark brown almost feathers of the um, rest of the bird. So initially you can leave this white and just shade this whole area where the main shadow is along the terminator. Then go ahead and shade all the dark feathers of the bird everywhere minus the tail and give it a nice uh, darker value and then find your terminator light uh, transitions to shadow and start darkening those to keep those two separate so they will always stay distinctly separate in value and therefore this will feel white and this will feel as another darker color so let's look at something with a little bit of color in it so this is colored pencil drawing of a tree a uh, tree is a uh, tree trunk is more of a cylinder that has a curvature to it. Same rules apply as of any curved surface. You have your light, as you can see, uh, the light is strongest right here. This is where it's the closest to the 90 degree uh, uh, angle of rays of light. Uh, this is also has a, some color to it, so the tree trunk itself was going between uh, orangey browns to grayish uh, and darker grays that looked almost bluish. Uh, even though it's changing color, you can still see that the light overall, the light is lightest and intense. You can also see that the shadow right along the terminator overall is darker. So even where it changes to a gray or blue color and then the bark changes into a brown or orange color, the shadow and the terminator continue to maintain their shape. That's what makes it look curved. Uh, same thing is happening right here. This was a much grayer bark area becoming lighter gray bark area. Uh, you can see that the terminator going right along here and your light to shadow is still happening. The transition is still happening. Transition is happening here and the reflection, the reflected light is being maintained as well all along the tree trunk. Right here this is your reflected light. It's being maintained intensifies a little bit maybe it was like a darker type of bark it's also facing into more like the upper parts where there's a lot of shaded areas so not a whole lot of reflected light is coming to here the bark changes again to lighter gray color but it is in the shadow and this whole area is considerably darker than the light you can compare this value considerably darker than the light and as it goes um, and continues up the tree branches everywhere where it meets the light you can see that it still maintains the same rules same rules light and shadow the darkest part slight reflection brightest light and you can notice right here the light is perhaps not as quite as intense as light it's the contrast is not as strong as right here and perhaps right here and that is again this is closest to us and as it goes up and into the tree canopy it's further away the contrasts are less intense and you shouldn't be making the light as bright as strong as right here and the contrast between light and shadow shouldn't be as strong as the ones that are closest to us all right so here we have an example of a landscape drawing basically it's a drawing of a big cliff and again the same rules of drawing a sphere light and shadow apply in here as well to simplify things i combined my highlights and center light into one very light value which is basically the white paper that is because to um the, it, it, since it's a sandstone formation, it, there's practically no highlights left. It's made out of sand. So the way it reflects light, it pretty much loses the areas of where the highlights are. They are very light, but it starts to combine with the center light value. 
so much that in the landscape drawing it's perfectly fine to combine them into one. Then the terminator where the light is simply not reaching anymore uh, is right here for instance and another one right here and you can see how this is also your darkest core shadow is following this shape. The darkest core shadow is right here blending with all of these crevices in the rock and all of this is your reflected light all of this is reflected light all of this is in the shadow and it's a various degree of reflected light in the rocks uh, a nice contrast between the sandstone and the trees the trees form a big uh, clump that is also somewhat following the spherical shape since the tree canopy is extending into all directions it is almost like in a regular spherical shape therefore it receives a lot of light and all of this is combined into overall light and all of this is combined into overall shadow with the shadow um, all of these deeper shadows I don't want to call them occlusions because it's slightly different than the spherical occlusion shadow but it is very similar it is the deepest parts in between the canopy the leaves and branches that receive least amount of light uh, all of this gets intensified uh, darker because the plants in front of it are closest to us and also receive a whole lot of light sunshine so it's perfectly fine to intensify your shadows combine them to push them in back and bring these plants forward also they are different color plants so these were like your darker greenery this is, was your very mild some of it was dried up uh, lighter brown beige tones and some of it was like a very mild greenish uh, green type of greenery that in the sunlight reads very very light so overall you can see how this is lighter overall these plants are darker uh, overall this light is all your center light overall this is your shadow with the various little degrees of darkening uh, one more example here the drapery the drapery uh, does a very similar thing to the spherical and cylindrical shapes and the fun part about the drapery is it's all transitioning into each other softly so to study the same thing light shadow transition reflections and uh, highlights uh, put some uh, just any fabric almost like this is a very plain white fabric that I just draped over a um, um, model that's made for sewing here I took one of the shawls and draped it over the same model and here I just took an easel and draped some cloth over it this cloth was a little more stiff and here I threw one of my blankets that I use every day over the couch to study all the same uh, drapery folds light shadow and effects so as you can see I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this one you can see exactly the same um, rules of shading apply in here as well the terminator pretty much follows this very um, curvy shape and that's the fun part you put the light on your drapery move it around find something that makes very interesting curvature between the light and shadow so right here right along the terminator is where the drastic change between light and shadow takes place you can see how the core shadow is very intense right here you can see how the core shadow is happening right here but there's so much reflection here that it washes out the core shadow a little bit and the occlusion shadow the deeper part in the fold is much stronger then uh, you can see how this part is shaded again this is your core shadow the most away from light is darkest there are reflections all in this area and an occlusion shadow is continuing right in here 
all of this is now in the shadow but it has so much reflected light off of other areas in the room that is looking considerably lighter than this part of the shadow so here even though it's in the shadow there is no direct light on it this area is even in the deeper shadow where fewer things reflect in this area and it's facing into the darker part of the room so this is facing slightly more into the part of the room that receives some of this direct light so more light is bouncing toward it making it a uh, stronger reflected light here it's going and facing into the darker part of the room where this direct light reaches less and less more of the darker objects and they are actually reflecting considerably less light therefore it's almost like they are reflecting the darkness in there but it's basically they are reflecting less and less light making this overall darker than this part of the shadow but nonetheless all of this is in the shadow all of this is in the shadow and within that you are playing with values for which areas are in a stronger shadow, less reflective light and so on. In this uh, drawing you can see distinctly how all the uh, little berries are basically your spheres with a few little variations like little bumps in them and within those spherical shapes you can still see the basic transition between light and shadow light and shadow you can see reflection you can see that the terminator is following the shadow of the lobes of each berry i'm going to zoom in a little bit more on that You can see how the uh, core shadow formed right along the terminator, that is where the sunlight doesn't reach it anymore, uh, is following the shapes of the lobes that form each berry. And this berry here, to make it look like it is closer to us compared to the other berries, has a stronger light, so the light is lightest. The core shadow is darkest, reflections are distinctly visible, the occlusion is where the occlusion shadows, where the berries lobes come so together deeply that they all connect in making that very deep little dent in there. And the berry right underneath it has a cast shadow from this berry which combines with the core shadow of the berry and you can see how the light here and the light here are different. This is stronger whiter, this is slightly darker. Not only that it is already kind of turning away from light and the strongest light would probably be here, but it also pushes it behind and makes it feel further back and not right in front of us. It is kind of amplified here but because it's such a small detailed drawing of small berries from the distance it makes it look uh, just right so if you look closely it seems like it's too too much of a difference when you stand back it actually looks just right and the same rule applies to pretty much every berry in here so this berry I didn't want to bring it too much forward therefore that berry is slightly less contrasting uh, these berries are going even further back. This berry is completely in back of all the others. Less contrast between light and shadow. Uh, this berry is just silhouette, completely pushed in the back. All of this few here receive a little bit of the light and shadow contrasts as well. And you can see now that I've zoomed out, you can see how it treats which berries come forward, which go back, and so on. Here's one of the examples where almost uh, close to a perfect sphere object is actually a natural object in nature. 
and this is an oak gall that is attached to a branch of scrub oak. Now oak galls are formed by little wasps, that's insects, that lay their eggs under the bark of oaks and as the oak uh, reacts to the foreign invader like wasp eggs it forms this protective layer that is somewhat like bark it's basically a shell that is empty inside and many times they swell up and as they're forming they're uh, reddish orangey kind of beige yellow in color very pretty when they're fresh and as they sit there on the branch and as the larva develops um, it starts to dry up and turn kind of beige brown in color uh, very light and eventually they fall off I don't think the wasps harm the plant but it forms this very interesting some people think it's fruit of some sort but it's not but nonetheless it's very interesting natural object attached to branches of oak and um, here being so nice and round and spherical it is very uh, good to study what it looks like right there in nature how the light reacts with it how um, the shadows form and being not totally perfect sphere you can see that there is a little um, distinction in the terminator is not perfectly um, crescent in this area though it basically follows a crescent shape but it has a little bit of the bumpiness so the shadow shows that as well in this case the shadow itself on the gall is light in color than the cast shadow from the leaf you can also notice that the leaf overlaps the gall right around the highlight area the highlight area I left completely white, it's white paper and as I started to go away from the highlight into my center light it just basically received very light um, lines for uh, giving it the first layer of value as the center light approached half tones I started to get the darker and intensify the darkness as it went into the shadow uh, I left a bit of the reflection here uh, which is very pretty much very strong reflection it was pretty distinct and I made the shadow I really liked how the shadow from the leaf was so nice and carved out you can see how the leaf right here almost touches and sits on the gall and in some places just lifts off a little bit off the gall and that is where your contrast between the cast shadow is the sharpest and strongest so the light is the whitest and the shadow is the darkest and as the shadow goes away from that light of the gall it becomes less and less intense and here it pretty much blends and starts to fade into our half tones now the, why would this shadow be so much darker it's the same surface of the gall the leaf itself is darker in value it's a, a strong green color and that strong green color even in the lightest part where the sun hits it is darker than the color which was the beige color of the gall and therefore the light bouncing off of the gall created lighter values where the light bouncing off of the greenery of the leaf was bouncing as still less uh, light so it appeared darker imagine what is happening under the leaf then since the leaf is such a dense darker uh, material and value it also reflects some of it, uh, its darkness and color onto the shadow and therefore it makes it much stronger right here and much darker than this uh, delicate shadow on the gall and this shadow here already picks up a lot of the reflected light from everything else around from other leaves from uh, other objects thank you for watching this video if you have any comments questions or suggestions please leave them down below in the comment section Please also visit my website elenorochet.com to see more of my artwork. 
You can support me on Patreon or through my website, elainroche.com, so I could continue producing more tutorial videos. I am also on Instagram, where you can follow my progress on teaching and plein air painting. My Instagram account is elena.roche.